My name is Brennan Collins from MakePath. We're a spatial data science uh, consultory. The um, thank you to the Project Geospatial team and Adam for organizing this great event and bringing us together here. Um, at, at, uh, at MakePath, we focus on bringing high quality open source tools uh, to the geospatial community. And um, so let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about how we create software and how we create software for geospatial. There's, um, there's many different tools out there. Python and R um, have emerged as leading tools in the data science community. And what we are trying to do is to push forward the, uh, those tools to uh, be able those to tools handle uh, large able those tools and also handle handle large numbers to extend those tools easily. Um, I'm going to be talking about two different libraries today. Um, one is X-Ray Spatial, which MakePath has created and released about three months ago. And another one is Data Shader. Um, I'm a core developer on both, both tools. And I think that um, you guys will get a lot out of this. And please think about questions. And we're going to do a question and answer session um, after, uh, after the main meet of this presentation. And so we know that uh, um, so creating high quality software is difficult. Creating high quality software that is free and open source has its own challenges. Um, to help fund open source software, we take client projects and we apply open source tools to help them solve their challenges. Um, so please check us out on uh, makepath.com and we also have Make MakePath blog and we're gonna be looking at that um, probably towards the end here. But uh, major thanks to Project Geospatial for organizing this. And um, let's, uh, let's take a look at Data Shader and X-Ray Spatial and understand how these tools fit into your um, uh, spatial analysis workflows. The first tool that we're looking at is uh, called Data Shader. Data Shader has been around since 2015. And this is a general purpose rasterization pipeline. And in geospatial science, we think of two different major format types. We think of vector data sets, which represent points, lines, and polygons. And we think about raster data sets, which are regularly gridded data sets, more appropriate for representing continuous phenomena, things like elevation, rainfall, population density. Many times those are symbolized using a raster as opposed to a vector, a point, line, or polygon, which is better for discrete phenomena. Things like um, uh, administrative boundaries, very well represented by lines or polygons, not as well represented by rasters. But Data Shader is about changing vectors into rasters at a, at a fundamental level. So that's the process of rasterization, taking a discrete data set and then making it gridded at some resolution. Um, and it's our pathway into a general raster analysis framework that's provided by X-Ray Spatial. So understanding this library Data Shader is very important for understanding the next step, which is looking at X-Array Spatial, which are utility functions on top of X-Array data arrays. I'm not sure how many people here are familiar with uh, NumPy as a library. NumPy is a foundational library inside the Python community. This is a very Python-focused uh, presentation, by the way, so uh, just for folks to know, we're gonna be, we are going to be looking at code and um, getting a little deeper than just the surface here. But NumPy forms the foundation that makes any of these tools are built on. Within the Python community, we have um, a bunch of libraries that have scikit at the beginning, things like scikit learn, scikit image, and a lot of those scikit libraries will be building on top of NumPy and SciPy um, for their, their numeric processing. So in understanding Data Shader, we're, um, we're first going to look at, at the problems that Data Shader solves. And we're gonna be coming back to this page and we're gonna to try to understand these five lines of code or really really three lines of code um, and what they're doing. So let's first understand the types of problems that Data Shader helps solve. Excuse me, I'm gonna scroll back up to the top here. And to understand the problems that Data Shader solves, you have to understand some of the, the pitfalls in visualization. So if we're trying to visualize a very large data set, um, we may find that if you, we start, say, say we're, we're, we want to plot a million or a billion or a trillion point locations in a single 800 by 400 pixel image. 
Well, as we start adding points, if we, if we associate a radius with each point, then we're going to quickly oversaturate the image as we hit, say, 10,000, 50,000 points. We're not going to be able to, to see structure in that data. As a, as a first look at where Data Shader plugs into your toolkit, let's consider how we would normally deal with the problem of oversaturation when visualizing large point sets. And so we have a couple of examples here of the heuristics that people use to deal with this. So we're at, in first kind of plotting pitfalls with overplotting, we see that we have two different distributions here. They're fairly normal distributions. And depending on which one we plot first, we're going to give the, the, um, the impression of more area of one of these data sets versus the other, because one is being plotted on top of the other. If we plot red first and then blue, um, it, everything appears to be mostly blue. If we, if we plot blue first and then red, everything appears to be red. And so in looking at this data, you can think of a bunch of ways to deal with this oversaturation problem in visualizing large data sets. One way you can do it is you can apply transparency. And then you can see the, de the relative density of how many points are overlaid by, um, by the alpha or the transparency. So here um, we've applied a uh, alpha of 0.1. So that's going from a range from zero to one uh, for opacity or transparency. And then we're stacking these together and we can maybe get a better impression of than what we had above. Um, but again, this is gonna rely on figuring out what this transparency value should be for your data set. And that'd be difficult as you change data sets and you have a brittle heuristic for visualizing things. Um, also, everything that I'm going to be presenting today is available um, on GitHub and also on the MakePath blog. And so we'll, we'll be posting some links uh, kind of below the video of, of how you can access uh, these, these notebooks. So oversampling is a problem. We tend to run into that problem first before undersampling problems, but undersampling also obscures structure in your data. And what we're trying to do in the data shader is, is reveal that structure without brittle heuristics like subsampling or transparency. Here we have five different uh, Gaussian distributions. We actually have, so here, as we plot a um, many points onto the same plot, we have an oversaturation problem in, in in A, we actually have five different point distributions going on, but they're obscured by how we're visualizing it. Um, we can assign a smaller size to each point, and that can start to help to reveal these distributions, but it's still difficult to make out what is going on. We can continue down that same strategy of making the points smaller, but we end up then with an undersampling or undersaturation problem. So here we have we're supposed to be seeing five different distributions and we're only seeing four. So let's see how data shader, and there's, there's a lot of content here. So I'm gonna let you guys go through this on your own time, some of it, but I'm just highlighting the major, major points for you. So what data shader does is data shader provides a generalized rasterization pipeline where in, by interjecting logic at different pipeline steps, you can deal with these undersaturation and oversaturation problems. Um, we do that by binning each point into by pixel. We look at um, which points fall into this specific pixel. So when we think of a single pixel in this image, we're taking we're getting a list of all the points that fall into that image, and then we're we're, we're applying a reduction function that's going to reduce those values into a, a single number. Then we can apply a color ramp across all the values um, in our image. So we started with say a million points. We figured out which pixel does each point fall into. What is a function that we can apply to each pixel that will reduce those points to a single value? And then how can we map color from the min value to the max value for that image? And we can apply color in, in several ways and we'll see where, where that's going here. In looking at the, the different strategies, some of the strategies that we reviewed in terms of dealing with overplotting, we can see this same, um, this same distribution in uh, using different, different techniques. 
and we can see the relative amount of structure that we get out of this. So here um, we have five different distributions. One might be difficult to see, but so we have one, if you can follow my mouse, one, two, three, four, five, this big one. So data shader will allow us in tweaking the, the different stages of the pipeline to reveal some of this structure. And the final view here um, is that we're able to apply a uh, different stretch functions to reveal this data. And we're gonna make this a little more concrete in our next examples. These are some of the plotting pitfalls that Data Shader just out of the box is gonna help you with. If you're trying to visualize large data sets um, and an output image is an acceptable output for you, then Data Shader is a great tool to look at to, um, to accomplish that. There's been a, there's a lot of activity in the Data Shader community. Um, some folks are using this in, uh, in various domains and also domains that are not specifically geospatial. So Data Shader is a general purpose rasterization pipeline. Um, we use it for geospatial, we use it for spatial. You can also use it for things like large time series data. Um, this is a notebook that someone recently tweeted, um, James Brennan. So I'd just like to make a shout out there, um, showing um, using Data Shader for large raster visualization. Right now, inside of Data Shader, there are um, several different data types as inputs for this rasterization pipeline. We talked about points, and here we're going to see our first example of points. Uh, we're looking at an image of the United States. It has uh, one point per person as of census 2010. So there's about uh, 308 million points that are plotted in this image here. The um, in looking at the code to understand how this maps to the pipeline, we're first going to load our data and we're using pandas to load our data. I'm going to make it a little larger for folks. Um, Adam, are you able to read the, the text on here okay? Cool, thanks. So the, we first start by loading a pandas data frame. That's a CSV of, of user locations or user points. We're then going to define our study area. And this represents really the, the first stage in the pipeline. What is your study area and what is its resolution? We imply its resolution by giving it a height and a width in pixels, but then we can also give it an X range and a Y range. And resolution is fundamentally a relationship and a ratio between width in pixel space and width in data space and height in data space. So, the, um, so it's this initial canvas step that sets up your scene we can use this canvas to aggregate data sets to that same resolution. And this gives us the ability to align our data and build up a cube of, of data that we've aggregated using the same canvas. And we're gonna see a lot of that coming up in, in X-ray spatial. We then use the canvas and decide what types are we aggregating into this scene? In this case, we're using points. It means that our, we're saying that our data frame has an X and Y column, and we're going to apply a mean function, which is our reduction function. So once we have binned all these points into pixels, we're going to apply a mean function across the Z column for all those points to get our single value. And that single value will be the value that will actually shade in the next step. So we've defined our study area. We've given it a resolution. We've aggregated data that we want into that scene. And then using a transfer function, we can shade that scene to get an output image. And here um, we have, we're shading, and this isn't actually the same image as the code applies here. We could probably change that, but we're shading from light blue to dark blue. And we're gonna apply a log function to all the values before we shade. Um, for Data sets that, that uh, have a lot of, that are not normally distributed, a log function can help level out all of those values so that we can actually see things. Population is a great example of that. New York and Los Angeles and Chicago um, have so many more people than the rest of the country that when, if you were to apply a linear color map uh, from the, the lowest value of population to the highest value of population in say Manhattan, then you would not be able to see many of the smaller towns and cities in the country. That's why we, in, in looking at population, we tend to 
apply a log function. And that's, that's what we see. Um, I have a, uh, uh, some, a bunch of other images that we're going to look at that we're going to look at that have, uh, that use log functions. Data shader also supports categoricals. Here we're looking at a map of race and ethnicity for New York City based on the same census data. And we're plotting one point per person in the, in the New York City area. And then our, our reduction function in this case is not a, a mean, but it's a um, max of who is, which category in this pixel has the most values. And we're going to assign a categorical color based on, on those values. And so here, um, the different colors repre represent the, the different races and ethnicities of the city. And this may, um, you know, align with what you know about the New York City area if you're familiar with areas like Chinatown um, and uh, other regions of the city. Data Shader is not just geospatial. Um, it's not even, it's spatial in general, but you can also apply it to any XY data set. Um, here we're looking at strange attractors where we're looking at the probability of a particle being in a certain place at a certain time. And um, you can get some interesting uh, visualizations out of this. So this is just stressing that Data Shader is a general purpose tool. It's not just specific for geospatial. Just to review this, this section of code here, because it will be important moving forward. Um, the stages of this data shader pipeline to move from vector to raster are basically create your scene, define your study area with a height and width and an X range and a Y range. Decide on um, what geometry type you're using to aggregate into that scene. In this case, we were using points. Other geometry types that are available include lines, polygons, tri meshes, quad meshes, and also um, rasters. So if you already have a gridded data set that's a, that's a raster, you can, you can resample that raster into this same scene so that it aligns with all of the vector data that you rasterize in the stack. This is Data Shader. Check it out on um, at its uh, GitHub page. So if we go over to um, HoloViz and Data Shader, and a huge thanks to the folks at um, Anaconda and Quansite who have who are the main sponsors of this project. Um, I've been working on this project since the inception of the project in 2015. It was started by Peter Wang and has been um, maintained uh, and really directed. And like a lot of these decisions were made by Jim Bednar, who's at Anaconda, and then. Um, we have a, you know, we all kind of work together to prioritize what the, the highest values issues are. This is a very accepting open community, great place if you if you have not made open source contributions in the past, go over to Data Shader and check out, check out the issues and see if there's any that you're specifically passionate about and, um, and you may like to make a contribution for. So Data Shader is a general purpose rasterization pipeline um, and it's available here at um, hollow viz for slash data shader on GitHub. So we were adding tons of geospatial tools to data shader. Um, we were adding things like surface analysis tools, zonal statistics tools, focal analysis tools. We've, uh, at, about three months ago, we moved all of those tools out into a separate library that's called X-Array Spatial. And that's where, where we're looking here. So X-Array Spatial is, an, is a new library which is a toolbox of uh, utility functions for X-ray objects. X-ray objects are uh, ras tend to be rasters. They wrap NumPy arrays. And the X-ray project in general is very focused on climate data. That's uh, what it was originally intended for or, or the impetus to create um, X-ray. And so X-ray spatial has, uh, you know, gains all the benefit of the work that's gone into the X-Array library. And let's start looking, to, to understand X-Array Spatial, it'd be good to start by looking at the user guide. And you, in GitHub, you can come over here to examples and you can access the user guide here. Um, I have the user guide running locally on my machine so that we can walk through um, some of the different utility functions that are available inside of X-Array Spatial. Um, I've just opened up the user guide and doing some imports. And one of the, the, the first things that's nice about X-Ray Spatial is that we have a um, generate terrain function. This will just give you some source data to play with. 
so that you don't have to say download a big data set um, to start with X-ray spatial. So here I've generated um, uh, just some sample data using Perlin noise. Uh, I've defined a canvas with a plot and a height and a width. This should be very familiar from, from, uh, from what we just talked about with data shader. I'm using a pseudo Mercator extent, but that, this could be anything for this, for this data. And then I'm gonna use the data shader shade function to actually stretch black to white linear over this space. And we get this, we get this output image that, uh, that looks very much like Perlin noise. Um, using the data shader shade function, we can then apply a color map um, across this, this data. And since I kind of want to play with the idea that this is terrain, I'm going to use an elevation color map that's available from X-ray spatial. And now we get into what is the analysis functions. So um, X-ray spatial is a very flat library. There's just a directory of tools, and each one of these tools takes an X-ray object as input. So they're very easy to use, and they're also very easy to extend, and we're going to be looking at that um, towards the end here. So surface analysis tools are, are, and visualization tools are kind of the first, first chunk of tools we're going to bite off here that's, our, that's available in X-ray spatial. We're looking at hillshade, so we're illuminating the terrain with a light source at a given azimuth and altitude. We're symbolizing it from gray to white um, with full uh, opacity and a linear stretch. And we imported the hillshade function from X-ray spatial, and we call it on our terrain, and then we get a hillshade layer out. So pretty, pretty basic stuff, but that can be nice for visualization, and we're going to use that as we go later for, for visualization. So now when I combine using the data shader stack function, stack is going to um, composite multiple data sets together for, uh, for visualization. So I'm now taking the illuminated uh, hillshade and stacking it with my terrain that's symbolized using an elevation color map. I'm setting the terrain at half opacity, um, and both are doing a linear stretch. And we're getting closer to seeing, imagining our, our, uh, our mythical islands here that were per, what we call the Perlandia for Perlin or something. So other, other um, analysis functions in here. Now we're getting into more traditional surface analysis tools. Um, so calculating slope. So in slope, right, the first derivative of the elevation, um, we're looking at the incline of, of the surface. And we're picking out areas somewhat arbitrarily, but like based on a um, uh, a thresholding of the slope data to to look at, hey, which slopes might be in risk of avalanche on this terrain. So we're using slope to highlight um, those areas. And the stack function within data shader is what gives us the ability to composite all of these layers together into a single image. Um, curvature, appropriate next one because it's the second derivative of slope. So in the same way that we think of um, uh, acceleration as the second derivative, you can imagine that in, as, uh, in two dimensions on a surface. And so uh, curvature is another tool, surface analysis tool that's available in here. And we're, we're picking out some, some areas of particularly uh, fast surfaces. You can also use uh, curvature to figure out whether a certain slope is um, uh, concave. And so there's, there's, uh, there's many things that you can do with curvature. We provide these tools and you can also, um, you can dive in to the internals of curvature really easily. And we'll, we'll take a look at diving into the internals in just a second. Aspect is the, is the direction that the slope is facing. That can be helpful for, um, certainly for avalanches, but also for agriculture. So we're looking at the cardinal direction of the, um, of the slope itself. Uh, NDVI is a vegetation index that when used on top of, say, Landsat data, you're able to pick out all of the pixels that are living plants in an area by comparing the difference between the near infrared and the red bands of a, um, of a multispectral image. Here, we're just showing the use of NDVI. Bump mapping is a cartographic technique. I'm not going to go too deep into bump mapping, but it is, it is um, nice for representing trees. So what I did here was I uh, added bumps into the terrain and then symbolized those bumps with a green color map. 
to give a pseudo impression of, of some sort of uh, land cover on top of this. There's some, there's some great uh, materials out there by cartographers on bump mapping. Ours is, ours is pretty rudimentary, but, uh, but I think it's fun. We have convolution filters. Convolution filters are very easy to write um, inside of X-ray spatial. Uh, we provide a mean one that's just an easy three by three mean convolution filter that can do things like smoothing uh, certain, certain edges. Right here, the mean filter was used to pr produce this vignette on the coastline. Um, that was done using a mean filter. There's different ways that you can actually do that inside of X-ray spatial, but a mean filter would be one of them. We can composite all of these layers together into a scene. And so now we have four different layers with our terrain. We're symbolizing water. We're adding a hill shade and we're adding a um, bump layer for our trees. So we're compositing all these together and we're building up a larger, a larger scene. Those are surface analysis tools. There are, there are are a bunch of other tools inside of X-ray spatial also that aren't specifically surface. So proximity is a very useful one. We provide the ability to create distance grids um, in a couple of using a couple of different distance metrics. I'm going to start by creating a pandas data frame of point locations. So we have uh, you know eight point locations here, and we created a canvas, right? So we're defining our study area. Then we know that our geometry type is point. We're using our, the data shader canvas, giving it a data frame and saying, which is our X column and which is our Y column. That gives us back a, uh, a point aggregate. Then uh, we're gonna, just gonna look at this. I'm using the dine spread function here simply to give these points a little more width so that we can look at them. Dine spread is inside of data shader and it will help you deal with under saturation issues. Say when you zoom in on a map so far that you only have a couple of points and when those rasterize, they rasterize to single pixels. So then we can spread them out using the dine spread function. And that's what's going on here. And we're applying a, uh, a, a spread of five pixels so that we can make out these points. This is getting us set up for running proximity tools. Um, this proximity tool here, we're, we've now generated a distance grid where each pixel in the grid is the distance from its nearest uh, point that we calculated the proximity on. Uh, there's, a, there's a couple of different distance metrics that you can select. In this case, I'm imagining that these points were latitude and longitude and that the appropriate distance metric would be a great circle distance as opposed to just a straight Cartesian Euclidean distance or a Manhattan distance. Both of those are available as just strings, but you can also provide your own distance functions here. You can write your own distance function. We give you a, uh, a signature for what that function needs to look like. And then, um, so if you wanted to add in your own Mahalanobis distance, or there's tons of different distance functions out there, we provide Great Circle, Manhattan, and Euclidean. These work on um, any of the um, data shader geometry types. So here we're doing, um, this is now Euclidean distance, but we're looking at Euclidean distance from a line. And so any of the tools here, any of the um, data shader outputs, you can run on X-ray spatial functions. And any of the geometry types as inputs to data shader work with X-ray spatial also. It gets really interesting when you do transforms on top of these outputs. We've achieved a buffer here, right? But what, I was do what I'm doing is that I'm taking the proximity grid and then I'm doing some thresholding for a certain distance. And so we can see that we've filtered out all the pixels except these pixels within a threshold distance of our line. Other tools that, uh, that are inside of X-ray spatial include ViewShed. ViewShed um, helps us identify the pixels that are in line of sight from an observer. In this image, we have an observer in, in orange, and we have uh, just a, a little distribution in the middle of the image, which represents a hill. When we apply ViewShed, excuse me, when, when we apply ViewShed, we're able to highlight all the pixels that are in a direct line of sight for this observer. That uh, is helpful for, for a lot of different things. You can think of um, real estate issues, or you can think of cell phone towers. Those all have potential line of sight applications. You can also specify 
how high is is the observer? What's what's the observer's altitude or height in doing this calculation? Um, and how and also how high above the pixels is the observer trying to see? So if I'm six feet tall and I'm standing on this mountain and I want to see a tower that's at this location at this altitude, that all of those um, are parameters to the the view shed function. So on view shed on a terrain, we're taking our terrain data uh, that we generated using Perlin noise. And now we're running a, um, we have our observer standing on the hillside over here. And let's look at everything that this observer can see in our terrain. And the fuchsia layer here represents all those pixels that are in a direct line of sight from our user or from our, excuse me, from our observer. That's view shed. Zonal statistics allows us to calculate summary stats for areas of our outputs. Um, we're imagining the same terrain. And let's think about if we were to go on a multi-day hike across this terrain. Each one of these line segment segments represents a day of our hike. And we want to calculate summary statistics for each day. So here I can take use um, X-ray spatial zonal stats function, pass in our zones, which are, which are our, these lines, and then pass in our terrain. And it will give us an output pandas data frame with one record per line and any of the summary stats. By default, we get, we're getting these five summary stats, but you can apply, you can add your own stat, custom stat functions and, uh, really go to town with, how, with the math in calculating the stats for a specific zone. So in those custom functions, we give you all the pixels for your zone and you just do the math on the zone. Um, if you don't have custom functions, then we, we have default summary stat functions like mean, max, standard deviation, and variance. Here we see a custom stat So we want um, inside of our custom stat, we want to know the elevation change. This is a very easy stat, but this shows the signature for doing a custom zonal stat. Um, this is an inline function. It takes a zone, and then it takes the zone max and, and the difference between the zone max and the zone min to have an elevation change. So we can see that um, maybe the second day um, had a lot of up and down uh, in, in the elevation change over that day. So these zonal stats work with the, any of the geometry types, point lines or polygons, tri meshes, quad meshes, and we'll calculate the stats for all non NAN values in the, in the zone. How are we doing on time here? Cool. Um, I definitely want to leave this open for some questions. I know I'm throwing a lot of material at folks. Some uh, additional recent additions to X-ray spatial include classification functions. These are very traditional kind of GIS classification for choropleth mapping. This first one is a quantile function. We're taking our terrain and then we're quantiling the terrain into 15 different bins and we're going to ignore zero values here. And then we're stacking this with a hill shade. And we can see that our terrain has been classified into 15 different groups. And then we can kind of see what are kind of pseudo ISO lines, right, of, uh, of the terrain. That's a quantile reclassify. And being good geospatial data scientists, you'd expect to also see, you know, equal interval and natural breaks or k-means in here. And we have both of those. So here we're doing an equal interval and you can compare these together and you can see some of the pros and cons of different classification methods. Certainly quantile is going, quantile is going to give you an equal number of colors generally across your image. So they tend to be very aesthetically pleasing, but the width of each bin is different in quantile. So right in quantile, every bin has the same number of samples in it. In equal interval, each bin has the same width. So that's why we see less white here um, for the high elevation areas. And then we also have uh, natural breaks. Natural breaks is basically 1D k-means and we support that and you can tweak the number of iterations that you attempt before it converges. Natural breaks will always converge, but you can 
you can turn down the number of iterations if you want to reduce the um, the number of computations. So these are these are a quick tour of some of the, the high level functions inside of um, X Ray Spatial. There's also tiling inside of X Ray Spatial, so you can create um, Web Mercator tile sets based on these images, and you do that by using X-Array render tiles is the name of the function. And here in this render tiles example, we're gonna start with a GeoPandas data frame. We're gonna load up um, the sample data that GeoPandas comes with. And GeoPandas is my kind of preferred Python library for vector data. We're going to uh, reproject this data into Web Mercator. Filter out Antarctica, sorry, Antarctica. And we're just gonna look at a plot to see our data. So this is just, this is vector data plotted. And in defining our, our, um, our tiles, we specify a couple of different functions um, in our tiling pipeline. So the, the first tile function that we look at is loading data. So this is asking for one top, for a specific tile, how do I load the data for that tile? Here are the X and Y range of the title, tile, give me back some data. In our load data function, we're then filtering the world geometry based on the X and Y range of the tile that we're currently producing. And then we're gonna sew these, these functions together in the final render, render tiles call so that um, you can see kind of how this all goes together. We first, we load our data for that tile. We figure out how to rasterize that data. In this case, we're using the canvas polygons as opposed to canvas points. In the past, we've seen canvas points. I don't think we've seen canvas polygons yet. And then we're gonna decide how we shade that function. So we're gonna shade that tile. We're gonna uh, give it a shader function. And this is going to output an actual image here at this point. And we also have a post render function if we wanted to do something like add a watermark to each one of the tiles. We can do that in our post render function. Here I'm, I'm adding a watermark of an X, Y, and Z location to the bottom of the tile. And we take these four functions that we that we put together and we supply them to render tiles. Render tiles will execute this using all the cores of your local machine. Or if you have a Dask cluster, it will allow you to use multiple machines and rendering a much larger tile set. So a common pattern that I use is that I test a tile set on um, a small number of ranges, say the first eight range, the first eight zoom levels. <coughs> Excuse me. And then I will um, rent a large Amazon machine, move this code, move this notebook over to a, you know, a hundred core machine on Amazon, and then produce the tiles at the higher resolution levels, like level 20, level 21, where you're, where you're getting millions and millions of tiles. Um, I'll do that on, um, on Amazon or on Google Cloud, and then write those tiles directly to some cloud storage, whether that be S3 or Google Drive or, um, Microsoft Box, wherever, wherever uh, there's cloud storage, we can write tiles directly to those, um, to those locations. So you don't fill up your hard drive. So that, that's a little look at tiling. Where are we going in the future with this? Well, some of the tools that are coming out, and we have a, a bunch of tools that are in alpha right now, but I wanna use this time a little bit to show those tools, but also show you how you could potentially contribute to X-ray spatial yourself. So let's take a look at, um, say, the, the classify tools. A lot of these are, are, um, are pretty recent. And we can take a look at, um, say, the quantile function. Let's take a look at quantile and give you a, 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 a small look behind the scenes into the source code of X-Array Spatial. So um, here we have our, our quantile function. That's the quantile that I called at the end of of the user guide notebook. Big shout out to, to PySAL. Thank you. The PySAL folks are, are outstanding and they, they have a really, really great library with for um, uh, geostatistics. And we use that as reference in implementing this on top of rasters. So what we're doing is um, we're, we have some data cleaning and certainly serializing a result, but we're delegating all the, the major heavy lifting to Numba functions. Numba is a library that makes Python code fast. 
you can think of number as a different relationship to C. Traditionally, what Python libraries do to gain performance in, in performance critical areas is that they write a C extension and then they wrap that C extension. And so for that tight loop, you get performance. Numba gives you the ability to just in time compile Python code um, and uh, be able be able to um, uh, then get more performance out of uh, out of your code. Sorry, I think my my monitor just had a, had a glitch there. So Numba is one of those libraries that if you don't know about, that um, you should definitely definitely check out. It's it is what gives us performance within X-ray spatial and within data shader. And so we have a lot of great examples of using Numba within both of those libraries. I'm sorry that my my monitor is going going a little nuts right now. The um, so uh, so Numba is one of those foundational libraries that we're using inside of X-ray spatial and inside of data shader that gives us code performance. And we can see an example of a Numba function um, here in the underscore bin. Underscore bin inside of this, this classification is going to be um, two libraries to additional libraries to highlight for us. One is Numba, and the other one is Dask. So Numba represents our vertical scaling and making our algorithms faster. Dask represents our horizontal scaling and allowing us to scale this analysis over multiple cores or multiple threads and multiple machines. So being able to run spatial analytics at scale on a, on a large cluster, that is possible with X-ray spatial and data shader using Dask, because we wrap Dask. Dask is, is, um, could be thought in, in, a, in an okay analogy to, to, the, to Spark in the Java ecosystem. There is also PySpark, but Dask was written in, in just native Python. So it has um, a much nicer experience for folks in the Python community that expect to see tracebacks in Python as opposed to tracebacks in Java. Uh, so Dask is Dask and Numba are, are the libraries that help us scale horizontally and vertically. And as I, as I, as I promised, I just wanted to show a Numba function here. So this is um, uh, just a normal Python function, but it's been decorated with this ng-jit decorator. This is gonna just in time compile this function into LLVM bytecode, and it understands NumPy. And that's one of the huge advantages of using Numba is that it, it understands NumPy. You, could, you may contrast Numba with other just-in-time compiling libraries or even languages for Python, including Cython. So there's, um, a, you achieve the, a similar order of magnitude performance increase with Numba and Cython. But Numba is not a separate language. Cython is actually a different language than Python, even though it's very close to Python. It's halfway between C and Python. Numba, you can decorate your functions and you can increase, you, you can get better performance out of your math. Numba is not going to help you with string manipulation. Don't write a regex parser using Numba. You would use Cython for that. Cython is much better at string parsing, um, at just string operations in general and performance of string operations. Numba is great for the scientific stack that's based on NumPy. That's why we're using Numba here as opposed to something like Cython to get our speed ups. Uh, so I've covered a lot of stuff here. I threw a lot of things at you guys. I apologize for some, some of the technical difficulty I had on my side. Um, I'd love to get some questions or see kind of, uh, you know, what folks think about this stuff. Um, some of that can happen now kind of in real time you know, kind of in Discord and you can put kind of questions there. But also you can reach out to us um, on GitHub uh, at uh, X-Array Spatial um, is a great place to put any of your issues, including feature requests. Um, there's certainly some tools in here that, uh, that we need to test more. Um, we have a hotspot analysis tool that came out last week that I didn't talk about because we're still kind of in the testing phase. But if you're interested in certain features and would like to um, champion those features, then we'd love to, we'd love to talk to you and, and collaborate together. Um, Adam, I'm not sure if you see any any questions or anything like that in the Discord. Um, yes, actually, I I, I do. Uh, a few questions are coming in. Uh, let me let me point to this while you uh, stop your screen sharing there for a second. Um, oh, so the first one that has come in, um, I'm going to kind of work backwards here. Is uh, why do you like GeoPandas over other vector libraries? 
Oh yeah. So, um, geo pandas has a really nice interface for interacting with the data and it's giving you the inherent row and column operations that pandas gives you. So instead of doing a loop over rows and columns to address each one of the elements in your data frame, you vectorize your calls across a G, uh, across a series. GeoPandas wraps Shapely, it wraps PyProj, um, which in turn go down to wrap Geos and GDAL. So Geo, GeoPandas has a GDAL and Geos dependency that can be a little heavy. It's um, There's another library that recently came out. It is very new, but we're using it in DataShader, which is called Spatial Pandas which does not have a GDAL Geos dependency. That is a nice feature of spatial pandas, but the breadth of the operations you can do on vectors is much, much smaller. GeoPandas wraps the premier open source vector library for all the geospatial folks, which is Geos and GDAL. There's been more work put into those libraries. They're outstanding libraries. Um, one of the value propositions of X-ray spatial is that it is not based on GDAL. There's no GDAL dependency inside of X-ray spatial explicitly. If you use it with GeoPandas, you're going to have to bring GDAL along um, for, for GeoPandas. But GeoPandas simply provides a great geospatial data frame type that can handle points, lines, and polygons. That's really the summarizing it. Great. So uh, let's go on to the next one here is what originally inspired the development of both of these tools, considering what other resources yeah. are out there? Yeah, that's thank you so much for bringing it up. So um, the there was a paper, the ideas behind data shader are um, were not created by the data shader team. We, we created the implementation and the pipeline. But there was a paper that was called um, abstract rendering, which you can look up, which has a uh, a good explanation of this idea of how you deal generically with problems of oversaturation and undersaturation. There's also a, a shout out to the Cooper Center. The Cooper Center, I believe in North Carolina, they put out a synthetic people map. Um, they created this idea of synthetic people where you take the finest grain census geography, the census block, and you equally distribute, you distribute the population of that census block as points. So you can create a synthetic data set of people. Uh, that's how we get that data set of 308 million points, is that there's, there's some synthetic people locations based on census blocks. The Cooper Center did just such an amazing job at doing this and visualizing it. And that was one of our main inspirations in starting Data Shader in 2015, was the um, abstract rendering project. Um, and also, um, you know, this, there's been a, a lot of great people supporting Data Shader Having um, Continuum Analytics and Anaconda supporting Data Shader was huge. Um, Incutel specifically was a, was was very big, and then also there's been um, SBIR grants to help with the funding of uh, of Data Shader. Funding models for open source are difficult. Our funding model is that we take open source projects and we help industry and we help clients solve their problems using those those open source projects. But it certainly wouldn't would not data shader and X-ray spatial would not have happened without um, without the small business innovation research grants and um, and the the support of uh, Intel. Awesome. So let me uh, bring it back in based off of what you talked about there. And this there, there's some overlap in what you just said. So uh, I, I think uh, another question that's popped up is what data sets are most commonly used with things like data shader. Uh, but I also want to connect that with things that you've already said, you know, uh, environmental data. And uh, you mentioned a lot of terrain analysis and that type of thing, but also some of the imagery data sets as well. Uh, so from your point of view, how do you see this being most used with data sets available right now? And then how does this apply to, you know, current research into, uh, uh, you know, imagery and machine learning best practices over, uh, over what's going on? Yeah. So, um, one, I mean, maybe, maybe just working backwards here, um, these tools, say you look at proximity, the proximity tool, these are very useful tools in doing feature engineering for ML models. If you're looking to add additional features to your model and you want those features to have some spatial component to them, then X-Array spatial, spatial can really help as an intermediate library to build up 
your model before training and predicting. Um, so that's a that's a, a nice way that this integrates with um, with ML tools. Uh, but there's um you know there's in in terms of where this is going in the future, this is re a lot of this is fundamentally about the relationship between high level dynamic programming languages like Python and lower level languages like C. Um, both of these libraries um, use have a different relationship to C than other open source Python libraries. We don't, instead of writing C extensions to make this fast, we use Numba. And it's that relationship between the, the productivity of dynamic programming languages like Python and R and the performance of lower level languages like C that, um, that we're playing in this space where we're, we're forming a new relationship to C and that relationship is based on NumPy. And just in just in time compiling Python to LLVM using Numba. Uh, so big picture, being able to put reconcile developer productivity with code performance is a big part of the future of these libraries. Where it's not a um, there's there's not a dichotomy between productivity and performance. We can have good performance without needing to have the context switching of changing programming languages through the use of, of Numba. Um, and also scaling, um, scaling geospatial analysis to um, uh, data sets that are larger than memory that need to be stored um, in special ways and then analyzed using clusters. So there's a, uh, certainly a scaling um, example here. Most folks, the data sets that folks are, are using DataShader for are data sets that usually are typically larger than 10 million vertices 10 million points, a million, if you're, if you're under a million points, say if we're just talking points, then you're probably not quite in data shader land yet, but folks are um, using this very, you know, into, into the large, larger data sets. Um, big data is, is a little bit of a loaded term, but we're talking the order of magnitude of a trillion points. If you're trying to visualize a trillion points off of a cluster, the shader is perfect for it. And uh, that's where that's our sweet spot is um, yeah, really and that, large. And when you say that those are good numbers to, to, to figure out, to benchmark yourself as you're figuring out what to prioritize for tools to use. You know, I'm thinking about, you know, your RF collection sensors out there or you, you mentioned cell towers earlier that gets into the millions. But that's just the point data. You know, you all start getting into the signals on top of the uh, cell towers and it, it gets into to even more on a daily uh, but the, but even maybe, you know, AIS data on top of that. Uh, but from an imagery standpoint, then you start looking at uh, individual objects per image over uh, hundreds of thousands of images taken over the course of years across multiple sensors. So mm -hmm. uh, tons of tons, tons of application there. So let's let's move this into another question here because we have limited time left. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm, I'm kind of curious, you mentioned moving uh, a lot of this processing into the cloud uh, to to increase performance or increase speed on scale. Uh, which cloud do you prefer? You mentioned Amazon, Google, and people are f trying to figure out Amazon, Google, or Azure. But for the type of work that this is aimed towards, which which one do you feel like is is a best use or what do you like using and, and why? Yeah, so uh, um, I think that I love Linux. I love Unix, and I, I like interfaces that give me access directly to machines. And I've had a preference for um, using S3 and EC2 as the um, as fundamental tools because they're they're so battle tested and so stable. And I know exactly kind of what I'm getting into there. But um, there's also we're certainly agnostic on on cloud providers and the the uh, the the tools that Google and Microsoft and Amazon um, provide, uh, we integrate with, with all of those tools in terms of having common interfaces with REST and HTTP and, um, and SSH. Those, those apply to all. So we're, we're generally happy using any of those providers. Um, by default, I tend to go with uh, S3 as, uh, as the place for, say, our first cloud tile renderer we wrote for S3. Um, because of, of just where it's at as, as just an absolutely amazing service. And so the S3 and Amazon is where is there's a little skew towards that within the code, but certainly it's really not hard to extend this. So you could write a um, Microsoft box tile render, or you could write 
a um, Google uh, Compute Cloud tile renderer. That would be a, a very small thing, and I'd love those contributions. If there's if there's folks out there listening that 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 sparks their interest, please ping us on on GitHub, and and we'll collaborate on that. And from that open source perspective, I'm really thinking about how a lot of folks in this community work with, uh, in the open community work with uh, Google Earth Engine and all the data sets within there, you know, and crossing, uh, uh, you know, and d just just to kind of work within that same environment. But of course, you know, a huge demographic for the geospatial frontier is within, uh, works with Amazon and uh, Microsoft right now. So it totally makes sense to have that kind of standard and compatibility. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have, so just to reiterate, we have the S3 tile renderer right now is a great example um, for uh, contributing other, other tile renders. And the point is that we never want to write tiles to local disk so that we can render billions of tiles without ever filling up disk. Well, I think uh, that's going to wrap up our session, uh, session for today. I really appreciate you coming on and talking to us ab about uh, Data Shader and X Spatial and uh, giving us your quick insights and overview. I hope a lot of folks find this uh, useful uh, to dive into you know, what the potential of these technologies are, apply it to their own workflows and use cases, uh, or just plain just explore what it can do for the data sets that they have. Uh, even if maybe they're not reaching a million or, or or, you know, over over a few million points, like you suggested, or reaching that trillion mark, uh, yes, I think yes. it's useful to experiment with what these tools are capable of doing. So uh, any last minute words before we sign off? Well, just thank you. Thank you. And, and uh, thanks to Project Geospatial for, for organizing this. This is, this is just a, a really great um, opportunity for us to gain exposure for our open source tools and, and help um, push this community forward so that we can have a inclusive and collaborative set of tools that everyone can read the source code of and can contribute to. So thank, thank you guys so much for that. And please check out the um, makepath.com forward slash blog. We have a, a lot of information there in our tools and, uh, and other tools within the open source geospatial community. So thank you. Thank you to, to Project Geospatial. Excellent. And we're going to include all those that you mentioned within our show notes uh, for folks to check out. So once again, I'm Adam Simmons with uh, the Geospatial Frontier, hosted by Project Geospatial and uh, partnered with the Geos uh, yeah, American Geographical Society uh, here with uh, Brendan Collins with MakePath. Thank you very much for listening, everybody. Thank you, guys. Thanks so much.